in SEAL training, we use the physical as a proxy to test the mental and to forge resilient mindsets that allow you to take your body farther than you ever thought possible. But if I was to, you know, assign a metric to it, what is, how much of it is physical and how much of it is mental, I think you have to meet some base level physical criteria, right? You have to be able to run a little bit. You got to be able to move your body through an obstacle course. You have to be able to swim or be comfortable on the water. But past that, it's just time and effort, right? As you slowly increase, you get reps, you increase the load, you increase the level of stress, the uncertainty, the requirements that you're placing upon your physical body. Eventually, your, your body builds to respond to those physical challenges, but it's always comes back to where's your mindset at? What does your mental fortitude look like? So that's how I would think about it. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Powers, and I want to thank you for joining me on the Fort Podcast today. This show is an open-ended discussion and journey covering real estate, business, entrepreneurship, and investing. I would love to hear from you by tweeting me at Fort Worth Chris on Twitter. Hey, guys, it's Chris. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Fort. I have Pat Dossett with me today, former Navy SEAL and now the founder of Made For. We have an incredible discussion about what life was like as a Navy SEAL, preparing to become a Navy SEAL, um, what you experience while you're in the SEALs. We talk about his transition back into the quote unquote real world and his experience in business school and at Google. And then the idea that he's working on now with his co-founder, Blake McCoskey, who is the founder of Tom's on this concept called Made For which is a 10-month program that harnesses the proven power of neuroscience to elevate your mental and physical baselines while cultivating a mindset that allows you to achieve everything you're truly made for. This is one of the most fun conversations I've had since starting this podcast. I learned a ton. Pat has had a ton of experience, and I think you'll really enjoy this episode. So thank you so much for continuing to join me on this journey, and I hope you enjoy. Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Man, I've been excited about this one. Let's just start out with a little bit about kind of your story growing up and then kind of the career. We'll get into the kind of where it took you to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I born and raised in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I, I I was very fortunate early on in my life to, to have uh, find a calling. And so when I was in seventh grade, I read a book about the SEAL teams called Rogue Warrior, written by a gentleman named Dick Marcinko. And for whatever reason, that just planted the seed inside my head that that's what I wanted to do. And it kind of became my my focus for all intents and purposes. And so I, I worked through high school towards that goal. And I was, I was fortunate enough to get an appointment to the Naval Academy out of Jesuit and went to the Naval Academy, showed up there as a wide-eyed uh, 17-year-old kid thinking that, well, this is a Navy school. And if, if I go to Navy school, that means I get to be a Navy SEAL. And I found out that's not exactly how it works, that you have to compete for these slots and nothing was guaranteed. But I was fortunate enough during my time at the Academy to to be one of the people that was was picked up for the for the SEAL program and then and then went from there. And so um yeah, that's that's basically how I got started. I usually ask this question at the end of the episode, but you kind of just answered it. So I'll just dive in. It's basically like it was there a time in early in your childhood or early in your life that kind of set the trajectory for the rest of your life. And you you kind of mentioned that book. What was it about the book or the thing that was like, this is what I want to do? I think for a lot of people, it's like when I think about being a Navy SEAL, you know, I don't know if this is good or bad to say, I think like I could just never do that. So I, it kind of goes away. But what was it? What was different for you? Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, I, I think the book was was an opportunity for everything to come into focus. And what I mean by that is my, you know, I grew up with my mom and my stepfather and uh, my stepdad, who I consider my dad, always championed this message of, hey, you're going to face decisions all throughout life. And he said 99.99% of the time, those decisions are going to come down to an easy road and a hard road. And he said, if you just take the hard road, I promise everything will work itself out. And he just, constantly beat that drum, you know, from the time that I was five years old to, you know, I still hear that message from him. 
And I think I just internalized that message to such a point that when I read that book, I was like, wow, here's a group of people that are doing maybe from the outside looking in is the hardest thing that you can do. And they're doing it for a larger purpose for a higher calling. And it just seemed like, man, all these pieces fit. This is what I want to do. And um, so it's probably a combination of factors, but the hearing the stories from the SEAL teams and just hearing the challenges that that those people were overcoming, both in training and in operations, it just I knew, hey, there's there's nothing else that compares to that. So that's what I wanted to, to try for. I love it, man. So you go to Naval Academy, you realize that there's a select amount of uh, spots to get into Navy SEALs. So kind of just walk me through that quick journey of go to Naval Academy and you've stamped your ticket to BUDS. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty wild. I, so I showed up and, and thinking, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to spend four years here and I'm going to suffer through these four years so that I can go to SEAL training. And very early on, I found out that they typically have 16 slots a year coming out of the academy um, and you have to compete for those slots. And so freshman year, we had about 100 people that wanted to be SEALs and and just over the course of subsequent years, they were running constantly running physical training tests and you were being evaluated on your academic performance and your leadership potential and how you were doing in sports and all these various metrics. And it culminated in senior year, the SEAL selection board basically ran one final screening test where everyone took the same physical evaluation and you saw how you stacked against your peers. They looked at your academic profile, they looked at your leadership, um, and then they brought you in for an eight, uh, I think there were eight people on the panel for um, an interview. They had a psychologist on the board and some SEAL leaders and some uh, people that were there at the academy, but basically looking to assess, all right, what is this candidate's potential? One, will they be successful going through training? And then two, is this the type of person that we want in the community? And I think at that point, from that initial group of 100, we had gotten down to maybe 65. And of those 65, probably 45 of them would have been great SEAL officers, but they only had 16 slots. So I was just fortunate enough, lucky enough to um, to get picked up. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's funny, I don't know if this, if this aired in my favor or not, but I, when I got to the academy, I decided that I was going to try my hand at boxing because every year one or two boxers would get a slot to, to, to seal training. I was like, all right, well, I, you know, I used to be a big guy. I played football. I could figure out this boxing thing and I'm not an athletic person, but for whatever reason, I had a hard head and I could punch hard and that allowed me to get through a lot of fights. And the day before my seal selection board, I actually had a fight in Baltimore and maybe 10 <laughs> seconds into the fight, this guy threw this wild haymaker and it sealed up perfectly against my my headgear and blew out my eardrum. And I don't know if you've ever ruptured an eardrum, but it really messes with your balance and your coordination and has all these these interesting knock-on effects. And so I proceeded for the rest of that fight just to get absolutely pummeled. There was nothing I could do. And so when I showed up for the interview board, I had two black eyes, busted nose. I couldn't hear out of one ear. And, <laughs> and I was just like, oh, you know, I, I, here I am. Take me. And uh, I was fortunate enough that it worked out. That's crazy, man. You you mentioned the physical, uh, like they look at your, when, when they're kind of judging who's going to make the final 16 and they're doing physical tests. But I've read a lot of Navy SEAL books, you know, always been interested in, in one of the recurring themes is it's more mental than it is physical. If you had to give like a percentage of like how much is being a Navy SEAL a, a focus on your physical attributes versus how mentally tough you are, like how would you think about that? I don't know if I'm asking that the right way, but. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great question. I, I think maybe one way to look at it is my class going into SEAL training started with around 220 people. <clears throat> the 220 people that showed up had all met the the base minimum thresholds for, you know, the physical, they had all the physical attributes they needed to be successful in SEAL training. They could run it, you know, one and a half miles a certain amount of time. They could do enough pull-ups, enough push-ups, enough sit-ups. They could swim. And not only could they do those physical, perform in those physical, physical metrics well enough to get started with a training program, but they had sacrificed for six months, 12 months, 18 months. Some people you know, on the order of years had jumped through a number of hoops to get to that point where they could start still training. So everyone has what they need when they start. And 
everything, even inside SEAL training, but especially in the SEAL teams, follows this crawl, walk, run methodology, right? So when you show up to SEAL training, you spend six weeks in an in-dock phase where they basically teach you how to run, they teach you how to swim, they teach you how to go through the O course, the obstacle course, they teach you, you know, proper form and all these various exercises, and then training begins. And very soon after training starts, you start to see attrition. It's a volunteer program. They have a bell that follows you everywhere you go. And when you decide you don't want to be a part of training anymore, you can ring the bell three times and uh, and be done. And that's it. So my class had started with 220. Um, by the time that we got to Hell Week, which is this around the fifth or sixth week uh, of training, this is a, a crucible defining event where you stay up for five and a half days. You don't you maybe sleep for one or two hours. Um, you're wet, you're cold, you're running everywhere with boats on your head, carrying logs, all the things that, that people have seen. We came out of Hell Week with 36 people. So from 220 to 150 to 36, and the class went on to graduate 17 original candidates from that group of 220. And you look at those 17 people at the end of the program, and they're rather unremarkable looking. Like you wouldn't have been able to pick them out from the lineup. And in fact, all of the biggest fastest, strongest people, the ones that most look the part, were some of the first to go away and decide that training wasn't for them. Even so, you know, in the first five minutes of Hell Week starting, the bell is ringing, right? And there's nothing you can do to someone in five minutes. Well, maybe there's some things you can do, but they don't do it in SEAL training where you're no colder, no wet, no more tired, no, you know, more physically exhausted in those first five minutes than you have been up until that point and then you have been in the years and months leading up to SEAL training, all the preparation that you've done, but people quit and they're just like, I can't do it. It's too much. The enormity of the thought that I'm going to be awake for a week, that I'm going to have to navigate all this stress and I'm already cold and already tired is just too much. So we use in SEAL training, um, we use the physical as a proxy to test the mental and to forge resilient mindsets that allow you to take your body farther than you ever thought possible. But if I was to, you know, to do a, to set the, you know, assign a metric to it, what is, how much of it is physical and how much of it is mental, I think you have to meet some base level physical criteria, right? You have to be able to run a little bit. You got to be able to move your body through an obstacle course. You have to be able to swim or be comfortable on the water. But past that, it's just time and effort, right? As you slowly increase, you get reps, you increase the load, you increase the level of stress, the uncertainty, the requirements that you're placing upon your physical body, eventually your, your body builds to respond to those physical challenges, but it's always comes back to where's your mindset at? What does your mental fortitude look like? So that's how I would think about it. You mentioned like, okay, so I think you said like a, a 36 people, is it 36 people started Hell Week or that's how many finished it? That's how many came out of Hell Week. So around 150 started with our class and 36 finished. And we were we were a winter Hell Week class. And so they run, uh, I think it's about six classes a year going through BUDS. And some classes are have their Hell Weeks during the summertime where the water is not as cold and the, um, it's maybe uh, a little bit more friendly from that from that standpoint. Um, and then the winter classes, the surf is bigger, the water is colder, it's, the attrition rates might be slightly higher in the winter, but um, yeah, so we came out with 36. And you kind of just mentioned like the enormity of the situation that people have gone that far and then, you know, five to 10 minutes into Hell Week, the bell's already ringing, which is a good, which is just a good kind of, not everybody goes through, is a Navy SEAL and goes through Hell Week, but there's just a lot of people that are faced with things in their life where the enormity of the situation usually stops them. And you had a quote that I read when I was preparing for this kind of about Hell Week where it's kind of a theme of focus on what's in front of you. What does that mean? Like, how do the SEALs talk about that? And what what do you mean by that? Yeah, so a little bit of context here. I think... Most people, when they think about preparing and performing in the, the, the hardest physical event that they're ever going to do in their lives, or you know, maybe you're training for an Ironman or a triathlon, or you're training for your first marathon, or your whatever it is, if you could imagine, all right, I have this physical event that I'm going to go through, and I want to make sure that I set myself up for success to perform that event, then you're probably 
in the weeks leading up to it, you're going to focus on your diet. You're going to make sure you're getting proper rest. You're going to try to reduce all the stressors in your life so that the day that you show up to perform in that event, you're able to bring your best to it. Hell Week is the exact opposite of that. In fact, those five weeks leading up to Hell Week, all you've been doing is breaking down your body, getting physically punished. Most people go into Hell Week with some form of low-grade pneumonia, some form of you know chronic stress injuries on their knees or on their shins or their shoulders are jacked up, their backs, necks. Everyone shows up to Hell Week almost in some ways broken. But the two days prior to Hell Week starting, you typically spend in isolation, either living on the beach in tents or locked up in a classroom. And you're told when they when they start Hell Week, it's called breakout. You're told, hey, we're going to break out any point in the next couple of days. And so you're you're the two days leading up to Hell Week, you're just on edge waiting for any time an instructor comes in. All right, is this it? Are we starting? And lots of false alarms. So, so much to the point that when it finally starts, you already just feel like you ran a marathon, like you've already performed in that big physical event. And so, yeah, five yeah. minutes in, you're cold, you're wet. And, and, and in my class, the way that they the way that they started us is they put us on these open deck amphibs, the kind that you saw in like Saving Private Ryan that lands us off the beach and the fronts drop down and you swim out. They put us on these boats and said, hey, we're going to go do our Hell Week out at San Clemente Island. And we loaded up on these boats. We had our fins. We were in our camouflage utilities. And they drove us around for about five hours and ocean spray is coming over. And so we're all kind of wet. The wind is blowing. We're cold. We don't have any jackets or anything. Nighttime on the Pacific waiting for the boats to arrive on San Clemente Island so that we can start this training. And after about five hours, they dropped the front of the boat down and we're maybe a mile off the, off the beach there in Coronado, which is where uh, we run, where SEAL training is run. Dropped the front downs and they say, okay, everyone swim to shore. So hop in the water, swim to the beach, you're cold, you get there and the instructors are like, all right, Hell Week's all about keeping you on your toes. This was a false alarm. Everyone knock out 20 push-ups, go back to your rooms and we'll kick this off again tomorrow. And so we do our 20 push-ups and then getting ready to run back to the barracks to dry off and get ready to um, for breakout maybe the next night. And then it starts and guns start going off and some munitions and fire hoses and it's loud and you're running around and it's chaotic and it is overwhelming. It is a sensory, from a sensory stimulation standpoint, it is just, it's a lot coming at you. And the people that and I remember, I remember very distinctly in those first five, 10 minutes of Hell Week, thinking to myself, wow, I've, I've worked so long from that first book I read in seventh grade to everything that I've gone through up to this point. And now I'm here. I've read about this moment and we've started. And it felt very much like being on the Texas Giant and the roller coasters clicking up the big hill. And it's just starting to crest. And you recognize that like, oh, wow, this is a big hill and there's no getting off. Right. Yep. Like we're going over the edge. And um, I just remember thinking like, oh, wow, here we here we go. Like, wow, I'm, I'm going to be up for the next week. That's crazy. And as soon as <laughs> that thought went through my mind, I was like, I got to get that. That's too much to process. It's like it's it's too overwhelming. And so immediately I returned to you. All right. Where's my swim buddy? What's in front of me? What are the next 10 feet? And the whole rest of the week played out in that fashion. Sometimes I thought, hey, I can focus on making it to the next meal. Sometimes I thought, yeah, I'm going to make it to Wednesday. Sometimes I thought I am going to, when I was running with a boat through the soft sand, like I feel like I am about to just crumble and, and I don't think I can go any further, but I can pick my head up and I can see 10 feet in front of me and I'm going to see if I can get that to the, you know, make it through the next 10 feet. And once I do that, I'll see where I'm at. And so you're constantly playing this game of adjusting the horizon, moving the finish line, um, however you want to frame it of, what is what do I feel is a manageable distance that I feel comfortable being in pursuit of? And then let me just focus on that. And then once I do that, let me celebrate that and then focus on what's next. Did you stay up all five and like you literally never sleep for one minute in five and a half days? Yeah. So the first chance you get to sleep, I want to say is on the third day, maybe there's about a 30 minute period where they put the whole class in a mud pit and you pull the boats over you and they're, they're spraying water on top of you. And someone's every once in a while is firing off some munitions just outside this pit. And you're in there for maybe 30, 45 minutes. And they're constantly 
yelling at you, keep your eyes open, keep your eyes open, keep your eyes open. And that's the first opportunity you really have to rest and to sleep. So not, not ideal conditions. And, and I don't think, you know, the sleep that you get in hell week is not about allowing you to restore any sense of capacity or, or help you recover the sleep. My viewpoint is, is to have you experience what it's like to wake up from a deep slumber and recognize that you're still very much in a challenging experience and that you know what comes from that so you lose people when they they bring you out of the sleep and they tell you all right back back in it people are just like i can't and they're done so man i i appreciate you sharing that story and on and on focusing what's in front of you you think there's a reason why as a society, like we're not taught more at an early age to kind of focus on the little things in front of you. I mean, especially today with how polarizing kind of social media and everything is, you know, you hear about like a successful business and all you hear about is all the the greatness about, you know, the founder made a billion dollars and, you know, everything was great, but they never talk about the day one till that point. And people just kind of assume that everything they just think of things in these huge visions rather than these little bites. Is there a reason why we don't learn that way or or that the SEALs do teach that way? Is there any kind of thought why most people don't think about the world that way? Man, that's a, it's a great question. I think there's a couple things there. One, um, the mountaintops are easiest to focus on, right? And so these these peak experiences or these the things that are are, are most visual from a success standpoint, from an outcome standpoint, are the things that, that we celebrate and they're easy to hold up on high. And so I think, and they're easy to market around, right? Like this billion dollar company or this, you know, this um, successful exit or this real estate acquisition or whatever the thing is, these mountaintop peak experiences are coming first in a race. I think they're so easy to focus on because I don't know, they're just easy to energize people around, but it, we're, What's not sexy is the process that set that up, right? And I know I've listened to many of the episodes from some of your previous guests, and you hear about the struggles and what it took and the fact that the process to get to this ultimate outcome is not a, it's not sexy. It's not, it's not something that's often celebrated, but I think it, it's what should be celebrated. And there's a, there's a, a researcher out of Stanford named Carol Dweck, who I'm sure your, your listeners are, are familiar with, but Carol's most, well known for her um, research in this uh, concept of a growth mindset, and she really coined this term. And it started with her her studies uh, around working with young kids. And what she found was that there were she was giving these groups of young kids harder and harder math problems to solve, and to a point where she started giving them problems to solve that couldn't be solved. And she noticed that there was something interesting that there was a a subset of kids that the harder the problems were to solve and even the problems that were impossible to solve, <clears throat> the that they got excited about that. They didn't get frustrated. They got energized by it. And she said, well, that's really interesting. What's going on there? And what she found through further research is that, that those kids were recognizing that the friction that they were experiencing, the effort that they were exerting was that is what it felt like to get better, to grow stronger. It wasn't a sign that they weren't capable of doing something or that they didn't have, they didn't have what they needed or that they, that they didn't have you know the abilities, but it was, this is what it feels like to get stronger and that they could, they could anchor into that and recognize like, Oh, this is awesome. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. And so I, I think we would all, and everyone's got this, you know, growth mindset inside of them and fixed mindset would be like, I'm not the type of person that can do that. I'm not the type of person that can be a Navy SEAL. I'll never get my first real estate deal done. I'm not good at math. I'm not, you know, whatever the thing is, like I'm I'm rigid and these are the things that I know and I'm inflexible and I can't, you know, this is what I can do and I'm naturally good at these innate things and that's where I need to stick to and I can't grow from there. It's something that um, ultimately holds people back, right? And we're, yeah. where we can foster these growth mindsets um, and even just even just knowing that there's a thing called growth mindset and fixed mindset, the research has shown that even knowing that allows you to perform better and to tap into this this growth mindset. So, but to answer your question more directly, I don't know why we we don't teach that. I'm, I'm I know a few educators that are starting to roll this out to their students, and it's something that we are we're we're starting to pay more attention to. Like, what's the process? Let's reward effort 
let's let go of outcomes, especially early on, and recognize that if we get the process right and we we understand how to reward effort, that the outcomes take care of themselves. And I'm not. This is not. A, I'm not advocating for getting rid of jump ropes because it's negative reinforcement or when someone doesn't achieve or or to pass out medals to everyone. But I do think that um, there is a there is a time and a place to let go of the, the what we would typically assign uh, as success and again focus on effort. Oh, I love that, and we're going to dive into that in in a little bit. I'll got a few more questions on the seals before I ask those. In that study, did they say that most of that was like genetic or how a kid is raised by their parents? Like it's something that's picked up on or did they, is it more assigned to kind of genetics or did they know? I would say the research shows that genetics does not play a role in this. So you can, you know, genetics plays a role in your level of affect and your kind of set points in how maybe gregarious or, or, um, you know, there's some personality dimensions that are are set and encoded by genetics, and you can you can adjust those ten to fifteen percent based upon um, your environment and some things that you do. But this growth mindset and fixed mindset, I, I think, where these are these are circuits that exist in, inside everyone, and it's a matter of are are the environments that these kids are finding themselves in, or the people that are finding themselves in, ones that foster growth of a growth mindset. And so I think it's it's much more about the environmentals and the conditions and the way that someone is engaged that far exceeds the genetic wiring that someone has when they, when they come out. Interesting. All right. One more question on kind of seal life. You know, y'all probably have the best training in the world. Y'all get your mindset right. You know, it's all about the team. What is the main reason that a, a seal mission fails? Is it usually a certain cause, or is there lots of reasons? Wow, that's a really that's a really good question. Well, I would I would start with uh, the enemy gets a vote, right? So you can do everything perfect, and things can still go wrong. And it's not to say that there aren't there aren't learnings to be had. And you know, we we are we do these very deep dive after action reviews. We do um, hot washes immediately after operations where we get everyone together and it's gloves off and what went wrong, what went right, and let's figure out how to, there's no ego involved in this, like what can we do better, how can we grow as a team, as an effective fighting force. And so it doesn't matter if it's a successful operation or it's an operation that, that went sideways. That's this this learning and this growth and this recognition that we have to maintain an orientation towards getting better and that we can't become fixed in our in our ways or our tactics or our procedures that they're constantly evolving because the environments we find ourselves in are constantly evolving. And so that is that's just a matter of course of how we do business. But that said, you know, what are the reasons why things go wrong? I think that rarely is it from a lack of preparation. I mean, we we train so much. And on such a in such a variety of environments, into a number of skill sets, and we train. We do individual training. We do team level training. We do unit level training when we're working with you know our joint partners and making sure that all the assets are working together collectively to be able to affect the battle space in, in a manner in which we want. So I don't think it's from it's not from a lack of preparation. It's not from a lack of training. Sometimes the environment changes faster than the tactics and the procedures evolve. And so, again, I think this just comes back to this idea of can you retain this growth mindset in an organization and be attuned to when a situation has changed? And I'll, I'll give up, you know, one example of this, just to put a point on it, is for the longest time, the SEAL teams trained towards clearing buildings and structures um, and targets using this hostage rescue mentality that and this was a holdover from tactics that that we had adopted from the SAS and from some other organizations. But it was this idea that as fast as we can get to the target, the hostage, the whatever, get through the target, that that was the goal. Speed was always the objective. And so for the longest time, we were clearing structures and moving through as fast as we could. We found when we got into Iraq 
and even into Afghanistan, that we were retaining this, we we're holding on to this uh, this idea of hostage clearance, move as fast as possible through the target. But the environment didn't necessitate us using that tactic. And in fact, oftentimes we would go to a target, we'd set a cordon for us, a blocking force. We owned the battle space. And so really time was on our side. It was up to us to how can we go through and clear a target, not necessarily fast, but in the safest, most effective manner possible. And so that was caused for an evolution in the way that we move through targets. Um, but had we not, had we been dogmatic around, this is the way we do things, this is what's uh, led us to help us be successful up to this point, and, and we're going to hold on to that and move that into whatever environment we find ourselves in, we would have continued to get guys killed and we would have been unsuccessful on target. So I think um, it's one of the one of the defining characteristics and, and uh, things that make the SEAL community so effective is that we figure out what levers work in whatever environment we find ourselves in. And it doesn't matter if it's something we've done in the past or we haven't, but whether we're in deserts or in mountains or in urban environments or coming out of the ocean or coming from the air or working out of embassies, it doesn't matter. We figure out a way to establish relevancy and be effective uh, wherever that, you know, whatever tactics are required for that. So. I can't, you know, I'm sure you've heard this a lot and your service and what you've done for the country is it's incredible. And I'm just I'm fascinated by uh, the Navy SEALs and kind of everything you all have been through. And so thank you for for sharing that. You've done some really cool stuff in your life and gives knuckleheads like me a chance to hang around this country feeling pretty good every day. So thank you. Uh, thanks for saying that, Chris. I And I think everyone that comes out of that transitions out of the teams out of the teams would say the same thing or or really anyone that that serves anything for any period of time that i got far more than i gave from the experience and so i showed up i tried to do my best every day and be a good team guy but i'll never be able to repay the what i got from serving alongside these quiet professionals from existing in that community from um, being able to be a part of of a big mission and to serve the country and support and defend the constitution of the United States. I mean, that's, it was, um, again, I got far more than I gave, but what's interesting and maybe, maybe it's a, a good transition is that as hard as various parts of being, you know, it will take SEAL training, for example, as hard as SEAL training was, I'm a few years removed from it now, but as hard as it was, there was always a bell to ring. There was always a bell that I could look over, not that I did, but if I wanted to, I know I could look over at any point I could ring that bell three times and I would get hot donuts and coffee and I could get, I could take a nap and I could hop off this train. Now, that of those options don't exist once you get in the combat environment, once you start working. But in training, when, you know, what most people think of is like, well, the hardest things on the planet, there is always that option to bail out. And what I've just grown so appreciative of since leading the teams and even, you know, in this past year and a half or past year, I've got a startup. I've got 18 month old twin girls. I have a pregnant wife. We've been under lockdown and quarantine and not once have I ever seen a bell that I could ring. Right. And so I'm so impressed by how people find ways to show up in their lives and perform and just in, in life every day, because there are no bells and there's no, bailing out of as much as we want to be out of this pandemic or we want to be out of um, the, the snowstorm that's uh, you know impacting a, a large segment of the country right now and certainly Texas and as, as much as we want to change the environment there's only so many things that we can affect and we always have to come back to all right what are the things that are within our control and how can we show up today in our lives that lifts us up lifts those up around us and know that there are no bells and so those are the uh those are the races, races I'm really interested in now is like the ones where there are no bells because I think that's those are there's some heroic efforts uh, taking place just every day for everyday people. There is, man. I love that that way of thinking about having that bell there. And I wonder how many people, whether it's in the SEAL teams or just in life, I keep thinking about like a SEAL that went and rang a bell, got that donut and like a blanket. And then after like 10 minutes of kind of calming down, immediate was like, you know, thanks. Like, did I just make the biggest mistake of my life? Like after, and I, you see that in business and a lot of people is like, they go ring that bell and then they're haunted with, I don't know if it's regret or remorse, but I just, I, for some reason, as you keep uh, talking about that, I just keep thinking 
and maybe you know the answer to this, like how many of those people that ring that bell, you know, immediately once they've kind of gotten that taste of that donut think, I should have never rang that bell. I, I need to be back out there again. Yeah, it's, man, I I really feel for those people. I know I would say without knowing specifics, maybe a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> that once you get out of the um <laughs> the immediacy of the moment and you're warm and you're comfortable again and you recognize like, man, I had a little bit more left, or I really did care about that and I wish I hadn't given into the moment. And um it's funny, there's a there's a, a gentleman in, in Dallas that is just an awesome guy and he went through SEAL training as a young kid. I think he was maybe 19, 20 years old and quit uh, during first phase. And it was something that he had some, maybe some girl stuff going on. I'm not sure the reason why that he punched out, but he decided, all right, I have to quit. And he went on, left, went into finance and maybe even spent some time in real estate, but he couldn't let it go. It was the one thing that stayed with him. He's like, man, I just, it burns inside me, this regret. I know that I left something on the table. And so he, at the age of 39, applied for a number of, you know, ways to case to get an age waiver and was able to come back in and was the oldest person to date to successfully go through SEAL training. Oh my God. And um, yeah, so at 39, I mean, SEAL training is hard at 18, it's hard at 21, it's hard at any age, but at 39, I mean, like, I can't, me going through SEAL training right now, I I don't know. Um, it's, it's, It's pretty impressive. So, but yeah, I think I think you're right. But you know, for what I would say is, right, most of us aren't in SEAL training. And most of us don't have this, you know, this one thing that SEAL training is very hard to get back into. Some some people do successfully make it back into, but for most people, they move on and they go off into the fleet and they uh, they go on and, and and on about their life. But for I would say for anyone that feels like, hey, I left something on the table and I wish I had that moment back. It, maybe just reframe that. Say, all right, what do I take from that? What do I learn? And recognize that, hey, you're on a very long journey, and it's not about these little mountaintop things or these these metrics of success. It's like, all right, well, what do I take from that experience, and how do I change how I'm showing up today so that today and going forward, you feel good about what you're doing. Yep, I love it. All right, let's transition. No pun intended. So you you make a transition out of the the SEALs, and you decide we can riff for a little bit on your time at Google and business school, and then we'll get into what you're doing today. But you make a decision to leave. How was that initial transition? And then what was the decision to go uh, to business school? And and what what did business school do for you? Uh, Good, bad, great, everything in between? So I would say the transition is hard. And I don't, I don't, it's funny, I have a number of friends that are professional athletes and, and they they echo similar sentiments that they have a really hard time transitioning. When your sole focus and and what you do every day and your is is tied to a profession, meaning that the at any moment in the 24 seven, uh, seven days a week, you're in it and you're a part of a, a community and an ethos and uh, you have a bigger mission and um, you are uh, just solely focused on that. I think when you unplug from that, it's hard. It's really hard to figure out, all right, what is that thing that I'm so viscerally connected to that, you know, as much as I was to the SEAL teams or professional football or whatnot, what is that next thing for me? Because there's a lot of life left to live. And I had a hard time with that. And to, I think, you know, what made it harder for me is a month after I got out, I lost My best friend and a number of friends um, were shot down in a helicopter in Afghanistan. And at the time, it was the single uh, largest loss of life in Afghanistan, maybe still to today, but certainly the largest loss we've had in the SEAL teams. And it put me in this place of, did I leave for the right reasons? Um, Do I need to go back in? Do I need to... Is, do I need to avenge this loss? Do I need to, you know, what am I doing? Was it, did I leave for selfish reasons? It it just brought up a whole host of emotions that I had to work through on top of just trying to transition out. So that, that made it really challenging. Ultimately, what allowed me to move through that is I recognized when I was in the teams and when I was getting to transition out that I love jumping, I love diving, I love shooting, I love blowing things up and traveling around and all the things that 
or I would say are surface level aspects of being in the SEAL teams. Like I love all of those things, but more than anything, I love the people and I loved working with a small group of people to on a, a mission that matters and achieving achieving outside positive effect and impact. So with a small group of, of people, you can go into a battle space and have far greater effects than um than than basically you should be be able to have. And so I really love that aspect. And so I recognize my while I was in the teams that at some point I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have kids and be able to be present for them and, and all of that. And I couldn't see how I was going to do that and stay in at the same time. And so I decided to, to make the transition out. And I this feeds into the business school. I said, all right, well, you know, I'm going to set down one tool set. I'm going to go to business school and pick up, hopefully pick up a new tool set. But ultimately I'm going to come back to the same thing. Like I have to, I have to work on missions that I care about. It has to be purposeful. I'm going to work with small teams to achieve outsized effects. And, and that's what I'm going to do. So and that's uh, that's what I've been focused on. I love it, man. So you go to Google and our, our mutual friend, Bradley, just kind of when I was talking to him, he said, uh, maybe ask him what in the SEAL teams, y'all pride yourselves on kind of thinking outside the box. And then you go to work for a company that's probably takes that to a, even a, a different extreme. What was the difference between thinking outside the box in a SEAL team and thinking outside the box in Google? And if you could riff a little bit on your experience at Google and, you know, this, the contrast there. I, I love this, this, this concept of, of being outside the box. You know, one of the, I would say one of the, the through lines between the SEAL teams and, and Google is the caliber of the individual. So in the, in the, in the SEAL teams, you just, the individuals that are part of that community are amazing. They're selfless. They put the team first. They focus on the mission. Um, when they're doing their job right, they're quiet professionals. And it's just an amazing community and group of individuals, very diverse individuals, perspectives, backgrounds, everything to be a part of. Um, inside Google, it's a massive organization. But on an individual level, the individuals are really, really smart. They're capable and they're generally well-intentioned. They want to do big things and do good things that matter. And so I think that was something that I really enjoyed about, um, about being in that environment. What's different about Google is when they think of problems to work on, unless it's going to impact a billion people, they're generally doesn't doesn't move the needle in the organization it's not it's not a big enough opportunity to pursue and so that i mean to me it was, it was just interesting like oh wow we're thinking about impacting a billion people here and that being your threshold for whether to start something or not is a different way of thinking um and it's something that that is runs across the organization so that that's cool you have it's interesting like if you were to compare the Google's uh, or the campus of Apple and Google, they are, they look very different and they're completely different organizations. Uh, you know, Apple's got this, this super, you know, this loop thing that's very futuristic looking and everything is, is perfect and their experiences are perfect and the designs and, and just the way that that organization runs is very tight and is about perfecting this one experience that apple owns google on the other hand is the campus is spread out all over all these disparate buildings they're always adding and subtracting and there's these teams that get put together and blown up and the only constant is everything is is kind of chaos it's just disorganized <laughs> and it just it's it's chaotic but um in that chaos they're able to find opportunities that allow them to respond in real time to you know opportunities. So I thought that's something that, that's interesting about that organization. But there are some there are some very big differences as well though. I remember in my first just a couple months in having an HR person pull me aside and say like, hey, we've received um some um some some complaints. And I said, oh no, like what did I do? Like I, I certainly don't want to offend anyone or whatnot. And they're like, well the 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 manner in which you are cutting your apple in meetings with your folding knife is scaring people. <laughs> and I was like, Oh wow. Okay. I was like, all right. Like I, like I'll, I'll change my ways, but like there's just something as simple as that. Like I had a pocket knife and then cut my apple and I'd eat my apple and there's, I didn't find it particularly threatening, but 
someone else received it that way. And so I, you know, I had to find a new way of, of, um, working with different types of people. Um, yeah, yeah. so, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> How did you react to that? Were you like, okay, I'll just change or were you, were you kind of like, well, this is stupid. Yeah. Well, I, you know, my, my initial reaction is, was, uh, probably not a, a positive one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, uh, and just, and coming from a community where people have really, really thick skin. And, um, if you have a, if you have a weakness, people are going to figure it out and they're going to keep poking at it until you either callous up or, uh, or you fold or you break ring the bell. You want to be a part of something else. Yeah. And so, um, just a different, it's just a different environment, but I'm also, look, there is no one way to do things. There's no one right way. And so, it was again a matter of me having to understand the new environment that I was operating in and how to be effective in that environment. And so I let I, I let my initial reaction go. I said, "All right, let me figure out what this is and, and how to move through it." And I did, and it's fine. I can imagine you came home that day from work, and maybe your wife uh, was like, "How was work?" And you're like, "It kind of sucked. Why did it suck?" <laughs> they told me I couldn't cut my apple with my pocket knife. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like there's there's always a, there's like this lost in translation and always feeling a little bit like a fish out of water and trying to figure out, all right, how do I how do I how do I, how do I navigate this reef? But it's you know at at the end of the day, I think you just have to find what's good in people and and how to work with different people. And there's you know I I know that the millennials get beat up on a lot and you know Gen Z or whatever different generations for being one way or another. And I think. Look, everyone has everyone has strengths, everyone has weaknesses, and we have to figure out it's on the leaders to figure out how to pull the best out of their people and um, pull the best out of the people and out of themselves. And you know, I I really did value the fact that people cared and and look, there were a lot of there were a lot of maybe prevailing viewpoints that I didn't agree with inside the inside the walls of Google. But that's okay. There was a very strong veteran network inside Google. And so knowing that I could, and the same thing held true at Wharton, that I could always look up and and find a veteran and say, like, all right, let's just let's check in. Like, are we seeing this from the same, you know, from the same viewpoint? And just having that ability to to plug into a veteran or someone that had a, a you know a shared common experience or background was always really helpful to me. So Okay. Now we're gonna get on to the big show. You are doing something now that you're very that's very mission driven and speaks to a lot of what we've just gone through talking about the company that you've now founded called Made For. And so can we kind of reintroduce kind of how that idea came about and what how you describe what Made For is? Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it, it's funny when I was in business school, so I took all the hard, you know, everything at, at, at Warden is very data driven and there's a lot of math and a lot of finance classes. I was um, certainly outside of my comfort zone and having to tap into my, my growth mindset in all of those courses, but I got a lot from it. But one of the classes that I, I, I took just so much from was actually not part of the MBA curriculum. I, I found it, it was an undergraduate class and I, I was already the old dude sitting in the back of, you know, sitting in these business school classes. And then I was the really old dude sitting in the back of this freshman uh, course. And the course was taught by a woman named um, Dr. Angela Duckworth. And she is renowned for her research in um, on grit and grit, this ability to stick to things and being the, the determining factor for success far exceeding IQ and income level and you know, whatever, but this idea of grit as the thing that allows you to be successful. So I was already interested in her research um, because I found that a lot of it mapped to what I experienced in the SEAL teams. But she was teaching a course that was called an introduction to positive psychology. On the surface, it sounded very soft, but as I started to peel back the layers and and understand what's going on, um, the field really emerged by the work of a gentleman named Dr. Martin Seligman out of the University of Pennsylvania. He would come into that course from time to time and talk. It was all about, well, let me let me back up. The field of psychology for the longest time was focused on harm reduction. How can we focus on minimizing downside risk, treating disease, treating mental illness, figuring out how can we how we can reduce negative behaviors, mindsets, whatever. Martin Seligman came along and he said, okay, that's great, but that is really only half of the equation. The other half of the equation is 
what are the things that allow us to um, that we can be in pursuit of, whether there are small things that we can do or things in our environment or mindsets we can cultivate that allow us to grow what's good inside us and grow our capacity to be better over time and and ultimately to live the most flourishing life possible. And that's really the genesis of of the field as we know it today. He and, and Angela and a number of others have just done so much research, so much work to really tease out what's going on underneath the hood when we're focused on positive pursuits and growing a bit inside us. And so that class, when I was sitting through it, I was like, wow, so much of what they're talking about is what I were things that I intuitively knew from my time in the teams and things that I saw people lean into to perform at really, really high levels. But they were they had research to map to it and they were proving these things out in studies and labs. And I just thought that was really fascinating. And so much like reading that book in seventh grade, Planted the Seed for Me about the SEAL teams, I would say that course and sitting in that class with with Angela put the seed inside me that like, there's something here. I want to do something around this. I just don't know what it is. Fast forward a few years, I was at Google and still doing research every day on, you know, behavioral science and neuroscience and physiology and understanding how all these things came together, behavioral economics. And I was on a trip with a group of guys. My co-founder with made for asked a question of the group. He said, you know, if you could, work on anything, if money was no object and you could just do a passion project, what would you want to work on? And everyone went around the table and we got to me. I said, you know, I don't know what form this takes, but I love this idea of helping people unlock potential and bring their best and do their best. Um, but using science and proven research and, um, you know, just entering into that, doing something in that vein whether it's through individuals or organizations or companies or teams, helping them discover their best. Because I saw it in the SEAL teams. I saw people, very common, ordinary people do extraordinary things. And I believe that same circuitry and wiring exists inside everyone. And so that was my response. And a couple of days after that trip, uh, Blake, who is my co-founder, Blake McCoskey, he sent me a note said, as soon as you said that, I wanted to do it. This is something I care about. Let's figure out what to do. And so that that started a number of conversations that ultimately led to to me leaving Google and working on Made4 full-time. And so that's what I've been doing since. I love it. Before we get into Made4, uh, you just mentioned Blake, who founder of Tom Shoes, obviously very mission-driven company, been very successful. Can you speak at all to something or, or maybe one or two things that you've learned from Blake along the way of what's made him a great businessman? Blake is so good at so many things, but I think one of the best, I think one of his, you know, strongest attributes in the business sense is the ability to sell and evangelize. If he believes in a message and he believes in a mission, I don't think there's anyone better that you could have on your team to champion that cause or that thing. He has a way of, of communicating and putting out a, a story or a narrative that people can understand that they believe in and can map into and you know, basically create movements. And I, you know, what he did with, with Tom shoes, certainly one for one had been done prior to Tom's, but it wasn't until he came along with Tom's and really evangelized this message that business can be a force for good, that we saw it take off. Right, and there's Warby Parker, or any number of these other entities that have fallen, you know, followed his lead. That people think about business differently, like how can whatever metrics you want to assign to it, but how can business be a force for good? He proved that it can be, and I think he was able to do that because he could evangelize and and put forth a narrative that people believed in. Very cool, especially in the world today, being able to be a storyteller with you know the distribution through social media and just online storytellers rise to the top, no doubt. Um, yeah, it, it, it's funny. I remember a, it, it, it's tangentially related. I remember sitting in a, a business school class and asking, we, the, the class got into discussion with the professor about Tesla. And and we were saying, what do you think about Tesla? And, and how should we think about the valuation of it and all this stuff? And he proceeded to put forth a case for about half an hour of why Tesla was unmoored from reality. The underlying economics didn't make any sense. The, you know, I just 
dot to dot to dot, he went through all of these reasons why Tesla wasn't going to work and why why the numbers didn't add up. But I think you know Elon has proven that if you have the right story and you can bring a lot of people along, that eventually the business will catch up to the story that you're putting out there. And so, um, you know, I think uh, it's it's just a, a different different look at it, but uh, similar similar thinking. Yeah, Charlie Munger, the well, arguably one of the greatest investors of all time, said recently, "I wouldn't invest in Elon, but I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against him either." And depending on what side of the coin you fall on, he is arguably our, our best storyteller right now on the planet. Um, yeah. It's interesting. All right. So you and Blake have this conversation. Uh, you guys have a meeting of the minds. And he says, I want to I want to work on this with you. You take off from Google. Let's just walk through kind of what the product is that you've built, the curriculum and kind of how you uh, how, how it all came to be. Yeah. So I, I would say early on, we Blake and I aligned on this on this vision or this mission of um, this idea that we believe a better world begins with the best you, and that if we can help individuals show up in their lives better, that everything else, the downstream effects of that, are, are just positive for the individual, for their family, for their company, for their community, and so on and so forth. And so that was really what we aligned on, and we aligned on from a partnership standpoint, we're going to be transparent and open and honest and, and just work, use that as a way to work together. And so I left Google with really, that was all we decided on. We didn't know what form this was going to take. Um, we started working around with some different models of the business and started working on the brand side of things very early, but again, didn't really know what made forward was going to be until maybe six months into this process. We thought, all right, you know, there's something interesting. We see a lot of um, these subscription box companies um, working really, really well. And we thought, well, what's interesting about that is that if we can get the unit economics right, and it's almost essentially the same as software as a service, that we can get the get the product right, get the unit economics right, and then we can serve as many people uh, as we can get the program out to. And so there was something interesting around the the box side of things. Um, we also looked at this idea of challenges, whether it's an ice bucket challenge or these challenges that are going around seem to be something that people really resonate with. They like the idea of, of challenges that they can take on and engage in. Um, and so we said, all right, well, we can take this box thing. We'll take this challenge thing. We need to figure out the science aspect and then, and then let's design something around that. Early on in the process, I started uh, uh, one of my friends, Dr. Andrew Huberman, is a neuroscientist out of Stanford University who studies the brain and how we can engage our brain in a way that allows us to be, you know, perform at the highest levels possible. Um, and he specifically, he's focused on things that we can do, things within our control, whether it's breathing, leveraging breath, or using the visual system, or different ways of thinking that we can engage in that allow us to uh, engage the brain to maximum effect. So I was uh, using Andrew as a thought partner and, hey, I'm thinking about this and this, and what do you think about this? And very, you know, early on, Andrew just became, it became so clear that Andrew was going to be a critical part of this, that Blake and I weren't the experts in some of these things. So we brought Andrew on to, to head our advisory board. Quickly after that, John Rady, the, a psychiatrist from Harvard University, uh, world-renowned, brought him on board, brought a number of other advisors on from National Institute of Health and a bunch of different different uh, places that allowed us to figure out, all right, rarely is access to information the thing that prohibits progress. It's not, we don't need to necessarily give people more, but we need to do is distill out from all the best science, from behavioral science and positive psychology and neuroscience and physiology, like what are the the signals that are really the levers that are going to have the greatest effect for people. And what does the science say? And then can we build our program around that? So in conjunction with our advisors, we built a program that's 10 months long that um, shows up every month. Every month is focused on a new foundational habit. There's a challenge associated. We deliver the science, the tools, the steps, and we give the support to help a member work through over the course of 10 months, not only these foundational habits and to change their behaviors in lasting ways, but also to cultivate a mindset that allows them to move through life differently um, and be 
the most effective they can be in whatever they want to do. So that's ultimately what we created is this 10 month program grounded in science. It's a program of small steps over time, uh, built on these foundational habits, but engaged in such a way that you're able to connect with your capacity to generate internal rewards, engage your brain and your body in a manner that sets you up for success. So, And so each month you get kind of a, another box with kind of that month's challenge and, you know, any type of learning material? That's right. Yeah. So the, the program, the, it's interesting, the challenges and obviously the, we didn't know that a pandemic was going to happen and that we were all going to be quarantined and isolated, but, and stuck on zoom calls all day long. Our challenges are all designed to be done offline. And so our program is, is an offline first program and it's, it's, it's kind of been the perfect program for the, for the right time. And that people get, people sign up for, um, for May 4 and every month we launch a new class of members. So, you know, we'll, we're, we're closing our, our uh, March class here in a couple of days. And on March 1st, a thousand people will start the same 10 month program and they'll go through it together, go through the program alongside, you know, a thousand other people. Each month you'll get a physical kit that shows up at your door. So you'll have uh, a tool that you would leverage over the course of the month. Um, you would have a publication with all of the relevant science and research and stories, um, and then a challenge designed around what's the smallest thing that we could get you to do this month where you would see the benefit of your actions and engage this, this foundational practice in a way that's right for you going forward. And so that's the program. It's the same every month. There's a new area of focus. We do, you know, the challenges are done offline. People really like this physical experience of the program, but we also have two-way texting and we have Zoom calls where we meet with our advisors or I meet with the classes once a month. Dr. Huber and myself host a, uh, a call with all of our members where we talk about a uh, relevant area of science or research and um, inspire people to engage the program and to stay uh, committed to, to the practice that they're, uh, that they're engaged in. And um, yeah, that's it. And it's, it's, been, it's been really, really cool to see you know, we at this point we have members in all 50 states, all different demographics, thousands of people all across the country. Not only individuals, but families going through, companies going through, and people really rediscovering their capacity to um, to exert control and to engage these practices in a way that lifts them up and allow them to navigate stress, uncertainty, life better. Of the thousand people that are going to go through the March class together, do they get to know each other and and do they socialize with each other? Or is it more just one on one with the company? Yeah, great question. So as you're going through the, someone could sign up and go through the entire program as an individual and never engage with someone else if that's what they wanted. But we found that people really do like this community aspect and being able to share wins and frustrations and losses alongside other people. And so we have. A private network where a private online community that people can get on to uh, engage with their fellow members in their class, engage with our advisors, with our team. And um, and that's been really nice to see uh, members support one another as they're going through the program. So um, it's there. And the way that I say it is, you know, we have all of these things, whether it's the two-way texting or the, the community or the base camps or the, the video calls that we do. All of these things exist for you to lean in or lean out of as much as you need for us to support you going through the program. And we spent a year in beta with around 1,300 members going through, collecting a lot of different data points as our members are going through. And the thing that has just become so clear for us is that if and when we get people to do the steps as we've laid them out, they see the benefits. And you can't not change going through this program. And so... Um, it's been it's been cool to see see people change through the course of the program and to and to find a ton of value in it. That's so cool. How many people have gone through it to date? We are approaching ten thousand uh, ten thousand members. So um, you know we we just started selling to the public in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our timing couldn't have been <laughs> better or worse, depending on how you're looking at it. Blake and I were funny. Blake and I were doing a press. Um, a little PR launch in New York and we were on the floor of the stock exchange on Cheddar TV and talking about made for on air and behind us just a sea of red. And I think at the time it was 
the maybe in the last 10 years, the greatest drop in the, in the Dow's, you know, over the last 10 years. And at that time it was like, Oh, something is, something is different. And I remember flying back to LA um, that night and landing in LA. And then I think two days later we went under lockdown and then quarantine. And so um, anyways, we, uh, so we've been in business for just over coming up on a year now. And um, we just couldn't be more happy with how it's going and the experiences our members are having. I love it, man. Can you just speak at all on kind of what happens, like maybe just pick one or two months, like just describe a couple of the challenges or what a monthly course might look like? Yeah. So our program starts in, in um, the areas, and all the areas of focus are on our website. So you can go on there and see the foundational habits that we focus on. Um, what members, members don't know what they're going to get and when they're going to get it or necessarily what the challenges are. But Everyone starts with the same challenge, and, and I've talked about this before. The first month focuses on hydration. It never surprises me, but it's it's always it's always cool to hear members say, "Man, I did this challenge, and I thought I had a good, you know, I thought I was always hydrated, or I have a good hydration practice, but I did the steps as you lay them out, and all these other things kind of found a place for me." And that's kind of how we designed the program. So, first month focuses on hydration. It's fifty percent around. The science of hydration, what it means to be, you know, properly hydrated. We dispel some myths. Um, the first one being that there's a one size fits all approach that everyone's supposed to drink eight cups of water a day or whatever you know you may have heard. We talk about what happens when you you have at low levels of dehydration, one to two percent. You actually start to have very real. Um, physical and cognitive deficits. And so these are things that you may not even be aware to or witting to, but that are impacting you and that affect maybe decisions that you're making. And so we talk about all of this that month. But I, what I tell our members is hey, this month's focus is 50% about hydration. It's 50% about, but it's also 50% around what happens when you pay attention to a small thing that you're doing every day and understand how it affects you. And some really cool things happen from that by just understanding how to focus your attention and awareness on the small things uh, and how it affects you. You start to notice other small things you're doing throughout your day and how they're affecting you. And and this serves as, as an entry point for the program and the months to follow. But so, for instance, that month we ask people, we give people a water bottle that uh, has a way of tracking how much water they're drinking. We ask them, track how much water you're drinking uh, every day for a period of time. And um, at the end of each day, record how much you drink. And then we want you to write a short little reflection around how much you drank and how you felt that day. And this all maps to the brain changes that we're looking for in this idea of neuroplasticity. And that Dr. Huberman talks about there's really two ways to change the brain. One is through a short, intense experience. can be positive or negative. But the other is really through small, consistent effort done over time and following this attention reward reinforcement loop that is a part of that's baked into our full program. So people are focused on a foundational habit, but they're also um, at the same time working on hydration. They're also working on their mindset. They're also working on the way that they're engaging their internal reward system, their brain, um, this idea of neuroplasticity so that by the time someone graduates made for, it's not that they have a checklist of 10 things they have to do every day, but rather that their reflexive self has now become their best self. They're just moving through their life differently and it's better um, and allowing them to be their best each and every day. Has there been any, uh, like what's the main reason why people show up? Is it because they're in a really bad spot in their life and they're looking to turn it around or, you know, maybe they're doing all right and they just want to get better. Like, is there a common theme of why people start your program? Yeah, it, it, I would say there are a couple of buckets. One is we get our, we get the optimizers, right? People that are always looking to be bigger, better, faster, stronger in whatever it is they're doing. And so if if they if this can help them do that, then um, they come to us looking for that. And so um, that's one that's one group. And and there's a lot of value for that group and made for. It. Sometimes it's just slowing down, and and oftentimes when we get into these routines that we get hyper focused on optimizing around, along the wrong uh, along certain things that comes at a cost that we might not be willing to. So those people find a ton of value with made for. The other group is this group that maybe they felt 
at some, if they were to look back in their life, they felt at some point they were crushing it. Like they were firing on all cylinders and everything was exactly as it was supposed to be. But they, at some point, got off track. And over a number of years, they have found themselves in a place that feels foreign or they feel like they can be doing better and should be doing much better, but they don't know how to get back on track. And I would say that is maybe makes up 50% of, uh, of our population at Mayforge. So a lot of people just trying to figure out how do I get back to where I was or how do I, you know, get onto a path that feels, you know, where I'm at my best and they recognize that they're not there. And then the third group is really these group, the uh, people that are just, facing real life and trying to deal with it. And they just need a lifeline to deal a little bit better. And so whether it's how to process and move through stress to navigate uncertainty of COVID or to deal with challenges that they're facing, um, they're just looking for anything that they, um, anything that might be able to support them in that. And so I would say those are our three groups that we see, but it ranges from, professional athletes to working uh, stay-at-home parents to any number of business professionals that kind of runs the gamut on um, on who our members are. And age, age from 18 to 82, wow. I believe, is our spread right now. It's never too late to get better, baby. <laughs> That's it. Well, you know, I think, the, I think the wild thing is that it's so rare that we take large lateral steps in life. And so if you were to think about, hey, I was on this path and maybe it's when you were in you know 28 years of age and you felt like everything was going on the right in the right direction and i was on this trajectory that was perfect for me and you map out where that trajectory takes you and but instead you're off of that trajectory maybe you're you're far beneath that or you're in a place where it feels foreign to you or you don't recognize yeah you don't recognize how you're showing up or, or who you are you think this is not who i am or what i value it is impossible to take one giant leap and get back onto that other trajectory. If that thing was even real or if that was the, the right way to think about it, it's impossible to take one giant step. But oftentimes the market will tell you that that is possible. Like just take this pill, just wear this device, just do this thing and we'll get you there. And people buy that stuff. They get, you know, they, they think, all right, there's, there's a real thing here. I can do this and they do it and they're not successful. And then they're left less certain about their capacity to change or to realize, you know, what it is that they're trying to realize in their life. And so rather than think about these big giant steps, think about all of those small, almost imperceptible decisions that you made, those steps that you took that put you where you're at today. It's going to take a lot of small steps to get you to a place that maybe far exceeds where you thought your trajectory could be or what would be successful for you. And made for is that process. Like, you know, we focus on very foundational basic things like how you can engage your breath, how you move your body, how you can invest in social connections, how you can cultivate an orientation towards recognizing the good, no matter the situation you'll find yourself in, this idea of, you know, gratitude. How can you engage with nature in a way that builds your capacity? All of these basic fundamental things that maybe our grandparents taught us that are free, that are always accessible, that are within our control. But for whatever reason, we've lost sight of their capacity to make a difference for us or for us to engage. And then we stepped over them in pursuit of quick fixes and fads and short-term gains. And so made for is very much returned to, let's go back to these small foundational steps. Let's engage them in such a way that works in concert with the way that your brain and body are designed so that you change um, so that you can start to see the lasting change and the results that you're looking for. Yep. Man, I couldn't think of a better time, honestly, to launch a uh, a company like this as we're coming out of one of the most trying years in American history. I, I, I've been studying on what you've been doing. Uh, preparing for this was so much fun. Um, and just getting to hear more from you, from you about the curriculum. Uh, what a cool opportunity in a time where, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are going to be looking to, you know, make life changes, uh, permanent life changes. So kudos to you. Let's do a couple oh, personal you. ones uh, and then we'll bring it home. I've been keeping you for a while. I know no, you're busy. I, 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 I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation. I hope this is this is helpful or this is, this is on point for you. It's um, awesome. So. No, this is incredible. What is one thing that you believe that most people don't believe? Ooh. Off the top rope, this is a this is a hard question. Um, 
Well, here's the truth. I don't know what most people believe, but what I would say is <laughs> I believe, <laughs> I, I, I truly believe in the unbounded potential of others. Um, and I believe that that everyone has something good inside them. It's just a matter of finding out how to access that and grow that. And so that's what I believe. I'm assuming that through uh, your life experiences and uh, being a Navy SEAL, you were probably waking up really early. Do you have a morning routine or a way that you get your day started? <laughs> Good morning. Oh, man. Um, it's funny. Well, I, I laugh because, you know, I, I live out in L.A. right now. This is where my, you know, my partner was. And so we, my wife and I moved out here to, to work on this business to get it started. But um, so much of the... Uh, the discourse in LA is about people's morning routines and like the perfect cup of tea and the yoga thing and whatever. And I'm just like, I'm kind of over morning routines, but what I would say is <laughs> what I do to, what I do to start my day is, um, I wake up usually around five, uh, sometimes four thirty. Um, I don't use an alarm clock. That's just, um, that's where I'm wired and how I wake up now. And the very first thing that I do is I drink a bottle of water because I know that I sometimes sleep with my mouth open and I blow I have a fan blowing up my face and I know that I'm dehydrated and I'm only going to benefit by drinking this bottle of water before I drink coffee. And so I start my day with a small thing that gets me into action and a you know, small win and and then I go from there. So my bottle of water, my coffee, I, I try to save that first hour in the day for reading uh, and and I try not to read. Uh, spend a lot of time in newspapers just because I, I find there's just a lot of noise there. So I, I really save that first hour for reading something either to develop myself professionally or personally or um, something I'm curious about. And then about 6 a.m., my girls wake up and it's really sacred time for me is that the first hour and a half with the girls, getting them up, feeding them, changing them taking them for a walk, do a walk every morning, go outside and walk for about a mile. Um, it's just sacred time. I turn off my phone and I'm fully present with them, get them back and, and going off on their day. And then, and then I dive into my day and, and um, wash, rinse, and repeat where I can. I love to, I love to work out before my day gets going. If it's, if it's an option, oftentimes I'm finding now that I don't have long periods of time where I can, where I can work out. And so I have these. I have a board where I have all of the different movements that I want to do throughout the day, and in between zooms, I find that you know I get ten seconds or a minute here, and I do little little mini pocket workouts, and then so by the end of the day, I've gotten uh, an, enough of an opportunity to move my body. But yeah, I don't know. That's my anti morning routine yeah. routine response. <laughs> I started asking it because I've never had one, and, and during COVID, I started walking like ninety minutes every morning by myself, and it kind of changed my whole world. So. I, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Just started asking people. I think starting your day by, and you can do this any number of ways, but checking in with yourself first before you check in with the rest of the world. And so, you know, that it could be a walk, it could be meditation, it could be just savoring a cup of coffee, but like take time to figure out where you're at and how you want to lean into your day before you open that phone or turn on your computer and have the you know, have the world knock you back on your heels and put you in response mode. Because once you get back on your heels and you're in response mode, it's hard to get out of that. And, and yeah, if you can preserve that, at least getting started leaning into your day, uh, I think it sets the rest of the day up very well. Too. So check in with yourself before you check in with the world. What's the best advice you've ever been given? I, it probably comes back to, you know, what I, what I said, my dad said, and that there's, there are 99% of decisions in life are easy and hard and pick the hard one and, and um, things will work out from there. And so um, I think that's something that I've internalized and maybe sometimes to a fall where I set myself up to suffer and not find the joy and to, to savor the moments. Um, and so that's something that I have to, I have to manage and recognize the wins along the way. But that's something that I think has, has impacted me and how I show up and certainly affected my trajectory in life if there is such a thing. How can people get in touch with you and made for? Yeah. Um I uh made for you can go to our website. It's uh ww dot 
getmadefor.com, G-E-T-M-A-D-E-F-O-R.com. Um, and you can find us on Instagram at made for, you can find me on Instagram at made for underscore Pat. Um, I'm trying to get better about, uh, posting there. My, my, my team helps, um, compel me to get more on social. I don't, it's a foreign world to me, but uh, I'm trying to get better about engaging on there. And then, yeah, if you have any questions about, you know, made for, you know, one of the things that we've seen, we've got about 20 corporate partners right now, ranging between 20 to 150 of organizations that have have gotten their teams on board made for and they've just seen a ton of value for their employees and for their teams and so that's something we're growing if you have any questions about that you can reach out to us on our site or uh, drop me a note on uh, on social and i'm happy to respond and answer any questions but you're the man i really appreciate you uh spending time with me today i'm i'm glad we got to get to know each other and hopefully we'll get to spend some time together given all the co- connections we have mutually. Oh yeah. I look, I look forward to it, Chris. And, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, next time we get back to Texas soon. We'd love to get some, uh, my, my passions outside of, uh, outside of made foreign kids or, um, Tex-Mex live music in the ocean. So, um, when I come to Texas, it's all about Tex-Mex and live music. So, um, we'd love to, uh, grab a beer, get some food and, uh, yeah, connect when I when I when I'm in t- when I'm in town next. But you know, my I know this this will go out here in the next few days. I just my heart goes out to everyone that's that's having to navigate a lot of challenges right now. Um, I hope that everyone can successfully move through this acute phase and, and come out of this, and and hopefully we can fix some of these underlying issues and, and not be in this situation again. So, man, I appreciate it, and yeah, I think if if there's one thing I'm I'm confident about, I think our best you know, years are ahead of us. We've been put through the ringer the last year. I think there's just a lot of people ready to to make it happen. Um, so appreciate you uh, saying that. I love it. I love it. Well, thank, thanks so much, Chris. And uh, wish you all the best and look forward to uh, connecting again soon. For sure. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, it's Chris here again. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star rating or write a quick review. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next episode. Chris Powers is the founder and CEO of Fort Capital LP. All opinions from Chris and guests of the Fort Podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Fort Capital LP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for real estate or investment decisions. The Fort with Chris Powers is produced by Straight Up Podcasts.